everybody. Uh, welcome to Mellon Auditorium for what should be an awesome uh, addition to our WL Mellon Speaker Series. Um, first things first, I'm Matt Rolek. I'm sure a lot of you know me. I know a lot of faces here. I'm a very new president of the GFA, and it's uh, my pleasure to introduce our guest. But first, I know you guys are, have some great lunches in front of you. Get rid of the opening of bags and the opening of drinks. Do your general rustling before we get started. That'd be phenomenal while I'm up here. And then uh, second, we'd just like to acknowledge the fantastic groups who have come together to put this on today. Uh, in alphabetical order, we've got the Alpha Club, the Graduate Finance Association, the Healthcare Club, Tepper Women in Business, Smart Women in Securities, and the Tepper Finance Group. So thank you all for making this possible, and thank you all for being here. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Deborah Cavaro, the CEO and Chairman of the Board of Ventas Inc. It is an S&P 500 company and a real estate investment trust with over 1,200 properties in the life services, senior health care, and, uh, and life science sectors in the UK and North America. Uh, beyond these incredible achievements, she also has numerous distinguishments on a lot of publications and organizations that we're all very familiar of. And if I didn't read these, I feel like it would be a disservice to her. We've got Forbes World's 100 Most Powerful Women for the second time in 2017, Harvard Business Review's Top 50 Best Performing CEOs in the World for four consecutive years, and she's one of two women on that list currently. National Real Estate Investor has recognized her as the top female executive in the commercial real estate industry. Modern Healthcare is one of the 100 most influential people in healthcare, again for the fourth time. Uh, she's one of Real Estate Forum's 70 elite industry shapers over the last 70 years, a member of Institutional Investors All-America Executive Team, Financial Times Top 50 Women in World Business, Modern Healthcare's Top 25 Women in Healthcare, and that, I promise you, is an abridged list. <laughs> <laughs> I wish my parents were here. <laughs> In addition to these incredible accolades, she also holds a multitude of additional roles. She is the chair-elect of the Real Estate Roundtable and on the executive committee of the Economic Club of Chicago. She also sits on the board of the Chicago Infrastructure Trust, the University of Chicago, the Executive Club of Chicago, and the World Business Chicago. But I think uh, those may pale in comparison to two incredibly important uh, Pittsburgh Art string tugs here. She is on the board of the PNC Financial Services Group and an owner of the back to back Stanley Cup champion, Pittsburgh Penguins. <laughs> Prior to this career at Ventas, she was the president and director of a New York Stock Exchange listed multifamily real estate investment trust, had a judicial career for 13 years, practiced law, and also was a judicial clerk for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. So that means you had a Juris Doctorate. I do, it, I do. From the University of Chicago Law School, where you are now a distinguished alumna. I am. And uh, she earned her Bachelor of the Arts, magna cum laude, from the University of Notre Dame. She's married, has two children, and we are incredibly grateful for the opportunity to have you here. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce the head of the MBA program as your moderator, distinguished service professor of finance, Kate barrett Cloth. And Tabrick <laughs> Navarro, thank you very much. Debbie, I'm absolutely delighted to be here talking to you, and thank you for making the time to come and see us today. It's I'm always a... great to be in my hometown. Thank Good. you for having me. It's great to see everyone. I'll admit to feeling a little intimidated and anxious, especially after such a terrific introduction. Um, but I'd like to start out by talking a little bit about you and then turn to Ventus and eventually open up to the audience. Um, so you're the first in your family to attend college. Uh, and I've, you've described yourself as a poor girl from Pittsburgh. Um, now, as, as Matt said, among other things, you're a lawyer by training, successful CEO, um, one of Forbes magazine's world's most powerful women, and you serve on numer numerous boards, including the University of Chicago's. How did you get from where you were to where you are today, and what are the sorts of things that drove you um, and developed the passion that you needed to be so successful? Well, thank you. Uh, I grew up in Mount Washington, and uh, not the nice part, definitely. My parents were really wonderful first-generation Americans who did what immigrant families have done from time immemorial, which is to sacrifice so that their children could have a better life, a better education, 
uh, and a better, just a better overall life. And I, a lot of what I've achieved and what I've done really flows from that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but they never really pushed me, I would say. Uh, I always had a love of learning. Uh, they encouraged me, obviously, to be the best that I could be. And I had many, many times over the years where luck played an incredible role in my path. I know a lot of people who come to work at Ventas, and maybe you're like this, want to have a very defined career path. Mine has been the opposite of that. Um, and uh, one early example was um, when I was in high school, I was shopping at one of the department stores downtown. It was Kaufman's then. And they used to have these things called college boards where young women who were in college would help girls who were going to college get their wardrobes together. It seems so uh, anachronistic, but that happened. And I met someone there who was at Smith College. And I was 15 or 16, and she said, well, where are you going to go to college? We got to talking. And I said, well, I don't really know if I'm going to college. And believe it or not, that happenstance meeting led me to say to my parents, hey, do you think I should take the SATs? They said, I don't know. What do you think? Oh, I maybe. Uh, and that young woman at the department store helped me apply to Smith College, where I ultimately applied and, and got in, much to my surprise. But no one I knew had heard of it, so I didn't go there. I went to Notre Dame instead, because people had heard of it. Um, and it, things like that, I mean, I might never have gone to college but for that. Mm -hmm. So I have probably 10 or 20 stories in my life like that, mm -hmm. that seem completely random and lucky that just somehow enabled me to get on the right path. And people can play such a critical role, can't they? Yes. An example or a mentor. Um, have you had mentors along the way, and how did you find those people? Well, I, would, I have had many, many mentors and people who have helped me along the way. And I never sought them out, I have to say that. I still find it very off-putting if someone I don't know comes and says, will you mentor me? Um, I think that um, mentorship is a two-way street. Mm -hmm. So I've always tried to add value. I haven't really in my career thought about what the other person could do for me, I've always tried to become valuable, productive, indispensable, if you will, around the people who I'm, with whom I'm working. And that was from a very young age, working in different stores and things, and then in college and law school. Uh, I tried to add a tremendous amount of value so that people would want to help me. Not even intentionally. I didn't do it so they would help me. I did it because I felt that I was getting a lot out of the investment that I was making. The byproduct of it has been that uh, people invested in me and my career and helped me. But I never started out asking people to help me. I started out saying, what can I do to make this company successful? What can I do to make this professor successful? What can I do to make this company successful? Mm -hmm. And then good things happen. Mm -hmm. Interesting. It's yeah. very mm -hmm. simple and homely, kind of. Mm -hmm. But for me, that has been how my career has mm -hmm. developed. Mm -hmm. By delivering value with every relationship that yes. you have. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Let's, let's turn to Ventus and talk about value <laughs> um, in a purely monetary sense, right? It's, the company has had remarkable success under your leadership. Um, as Matt described it, Ventus is a real estate investment trust um, that invests in the area of healthcare, life sciences, and senior living. Uh, the company has had a history of delivering strong returns to shareholders. Yes. Uh, and you've outperformed benchmark indices um, such as the MSCI US REIT index and the S&P 500 index for the past 18 years. Mm -hmm. um, you're widely recognized for your strategic vision and the contributions that you've made to that success. Uh, and you've developed and driven the strategy that's driven that success. 
Could you talk a little bit about the company's growth since you started at Ventus and what were some of the key decision points along the way for you? Well, success in business is a team effort. It really is a lot. There are so many parallels between sports and uh, a business. And in fact, I've never taken a business class and I continue to learn and evolve as a, as a manager and a leader, even at my age of 60. Um, but it really is a team. It's one team, one dream. And so there are a lot of people at Ventas who've had a lot to do over the years with the company's success. Um, we have been very focused on delivering superior, consistent returns to shareholders. We have 24% compound annual return since 2000. Uh, there's a lot that has gone into that, the macro and the micro. I think we, in the early days, really just had to survive uh, without permanently impairing capital. In the financial crisis, we had to be strong and not impair capital. Uh, one of the things I talked about with the students we met with before this is one secret to superior returns is never to blow up because you can never make it back mathematically. It just doesn't happen. Um, but the, what, what we really did is come into a fairly inert sector at a time when uh, the macro was primed for consolidation and really just see the power that's in the intersection of healthcare and real estate and the demographics and how we could use our capital to grow and pro provide returns to shareholders that had uh, less risk than perceived and therefore higher returns. I always say that the investments we've made have been core-like risk, which is relatively low risk, with above core returns. And I think our, our insight, if there was such a thing, was really seeing the potential in the macro and getting after it. And, and, and nobody else was doing that. Mm -hmm. It really wasn't that hard. Um, the strategy is, is very, that, that we came up with was very simple. It was grow, diversify, get into different segments. Um, it, it was not a genius strategy. It wasn't going to Mars or anything like mm -hmm. that. But it was a thoughtful strategy that was insightful in the macro environment when nobody else was doing it. And then we just executed it. We executed the hell out of it. And it was obviously successful. And we are students of the environment. And we have, we've been nimble. Mm. So we have changed just in advance of everybody else realizing that you had to change. Mm. And that has been really important as well. So reading those macro signs and quickly reacting to them, having the courage of our convictions, um, and that has been very beneficial to delivering superior returns as well. Mm -hmm. So thinking, I mean, you've described timing as very important, being nimble is very important. Looking ahead, what are some trends that you're seeing in the industry? And um, if you can, are the, what are the opportunities that you see for further growth? Mm -hmm. Well, we're in, a, we're in a market wobble right now. And luckily, we did see it coming. So... Um, uh, and we've prepared for that again by coming off the risk spectrum and once again uh, becoming more cautious, I would say starting toward the end of 16 and going into 17. And the changes that we saw coming, like the financial crisis, again, are there for all to see if you're prepared to pay attention. And it was growing oversupply in, the, in certain markets in the senior housing business. So while we were buying a lot of assets going up to that, we, we stopped doing that, in fact, started selling some. Uh, we saw uh, clearly from an economic standpoint that you have some policymakers who are throwing economic stimulus on a late cycle expansion and a full wage economy, which is going with deficits. So 
you have an environment that is not the best for REITs and isn't the greatest for healthcare companies who are, we are a financial company, but our customers employ a lot of low wage mm -hmm. employees and you're seeing wage pressures there and their margins are compressing. So we have basically rotated our capital over the last couple of years to have A, a stronger balance sheet, to B, get focused on a really exciting growing area, which is this university-based life science, where we are providing capital to highly rated universities um, to enable them to build the kind of research and development facilities that they really like. And so we've, we've rotated uh, more toward that business and some uh, development and redevelopment of assets and away from our more classic acquisition funding. Mm -hmm. And again, I think, and, and we sold a bunch of nursing homes at a very high price. So those were all 15, 16, 17, sort of preparing for where we are right now. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of how long you feel this wobble will last? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about the wobble. I'm not that good. I'm good, but I'm not that good. I mean, it, um, there's always a lag. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, some of it will depend on policy. And, uh, but we're preparing for a, a pretty sizable mm -hmm. cyclical shift. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, how about technology? What role does technology play uh, in the success that you've had and where you see it going? Um, I wish I could say a lot. Mm -hmm. um, we're still, real estate is a, still a pretty old school kind of business. And I would say in healthcare, you are seeing a lot of technological changes to make the business more efficient in hospitals, for example, um, and in senior living, but still very early days. What I think the senior living business would benefit from so greatly is more data analytics. And so for those of you who think senior living is sexy, I encourage you uh, because I think cash flow is sexy. Senior living has cash flow, therefore. Um, but I, I do think the business is going to really needs technology and data to go to that next level. And one of the challenges that I have for myself in the coming year or two is to really think about, and if you have ideas, please bring them to me, to really think about, so here we are at Ventas, we've got over 1,200 sites where we, um, where seniors live with dignity, medical office and outpatient, where literally, and hospitals, where literally millions of people and families are coming every year to get care. So how can we leverage that with an Amazon, with a Google, with, um, an apple to say, we have all this information, we have this footprint. How can we use that for the benefit of the people who are using our sites, but also for the benefit of the technology providers to really mine information about this important population? Remember the over 80, the over 85 is the fastest, the oldest old is the fastest growing part mm -hmm. of the United States population. And so, and we still don't know a lot about that population. So figuring out how to leverage that footprint for the benefit of our customers, ourselves, our shareholders, and the technology providers is something I do want to spend more time on. Mm -hmm. I think you've just heard the challenge thrown out everybody. So. <laughs> I know. I want a case study on yeah. this. Yes. <laughs> What about corporate responsibility? Has that played a role in the success of Ventus? So I would say in the early days, acting with honesty and integrity and ethics obviously runs all the way through our co company and, and always has. But it wasn't more formally known as ESG or corporate responsibility. As we have become larger and more successful, 
we have taken on the challenge of being more intentional about our corporate responsibility. So we have done things like trying to end senior hunger in Chicago. When you think about it, gosh, we, we generate all this cash flow, $2 billion a year in net operating income from a senior population. We ought to be using that for the benefit of seniors who can't take advantage of our products and services. Um, we've, we've done more with diversity on our board, very, again, very intentionally. And then from an environmental standpoint, we have made huge strides and are the leading uh, healthcare real estate company in terms of our commitment to water conservation, energy conservation, LEED certified buildings. Still so much more to do but we have been recognized by being included in the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, among other things, for our commitments. Um, again, a lot more to do. I would not say our business is in a leadership position if you think about companies writ large, but we are doing what we can to be a leader within our space in those areas, and we take them very seriously. Can I ask a little bit more about diversity on your board? Yes. Um, so can you talk a little bit about why this is important to the company? Yes, that's easy. Um, diverse groups make better decisions. Diverse groups have better returns, period. I mean, that's it. Mm -hmm. so, so why wouldn't everyone want that? Mm -hmm. Well, let me segue there. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's very logical, um, and, and uh, we found we, we have not diversified for diversification's sake. I mean, the women we have on the board are cold-blooded, killer, incredibly accomplished <laughs> um, people. Uh, one started a hedge fu uh, uh, fund of funds, Aurora, and grew it to, you know, 20 billion, and is highly quantitative and very helpful. The other is a policy expert. So you get awards for having 30% women on your board, on your board, which doesn't seem like an award worthy, mm -hmm. but it is. And so that's what we have. And I think our board is a, a good example of a board that, that is very functional mm -hmm. and very productive and, and works well for the shareholders. Mm -hmm. So, so my segue was going to be asking you about being um, one of the 2016 top 100 best performing CEOs in the world, uh, ranked by the Harvard Business Review. Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I mean, we know University of Chicago and Tepper are better. <laughs> but we I'll take the award. The I'll take yep. the award, yes. So you're the only woman in the top 50 uh, and one of only two women in the top 100. How do you react to that? Oh, well, I'm glad to be in it. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll say that. Um, I, I was talking again with the group earlier, saying that we have made so much progress. Things are so much better than they were when I started working in 1983. Um, I have a lot of Me Too stories, just like I would argue almost any woman who's been in the workforce. Um, but yet we're still talking about the same things that we talked about 30 something years ago, which is uh, the lack of numbers mm -hmm. and some of the issues around how to, how to be successful, particularly in these hard charging, uh, banking, consulting types of, of CEO types of roles. Um, so I wish there were more, mm -hmm. is what I would say. Uh, I do think that you know women early in their careers have a really good shot. And then if you make it through that middle part, you also have a really good shot. But making it through that middle part is a real challenge. And you. You, you have to really want it, and you have to make a lot of sacrifices. And it's definitely not easy. And you have to have a lot of support around you and um, be lucky as well. So 
it's hard to get through that maze mm -hmm. to get mm -hmm. to be the CEO. Mm -hmm. You've just described the individual challenge. Um, are there, what else do you think it will take for women to get more representation in, in rankings and surveys and groups like this? Well, you have to have the returns. I mean, it's all based on returns and a little bit on ESG, maybe 20%. Uh, but our returns were in the top 4% of global companies, uh, and that's how you get on the list. And um, at the end of the day, I continue to believe it's about achievement and putting the numbers on the board. And that's what people respect, and that's what they give awards to. And whether you're a woman or a man, that's what you've got to deliver. I mean, that's what we get paid for. And so more women should do that. <laughs> um, and, and Harvard gets the, get, it's, a very, it's a very quantitative mm -hmm. survey. Mm -hmm. um, but literally making it through that middle part, I think, is where the structural challenges lie. What is the middle part? It's, it's when you're having a family. It's when you're kind of getting to be a, you know, a, a, a boss and you have to make sacrifices mm -hmm. in order to you know, do the things at work that get people promoted and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I do think there are structural challenges there, but I do know, you know several, many women on Wall Street who've, who've, who've made it through and they've all done it differently. Uh, but the key ingredient, I would say, is that you kind of have to be willing to let a lot of stuff that isn't work-related mm -hmm. put it off to the side mm -hmm. because you, you can't kind of do it all. Mm -hmm. Or mo I can't. Mm -hmm. Maybe other people can. Mm -hmm. but, um, and feel good about that. Right. So. Right. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's, it's not welcome ad advice no. in, in a sense, but I, I do think it's practical. Mm -hmm. So I feel okay that my house is a mess. And exactly. In the shop. And <laughs> yes, exactly. You've exactly. given me permission. Absolutely. <laughs> so I, I want to um, turn over to the audience shortly, but being in Pittsburgh, I would be remiss and probably in trouble if I didn't ask you about sports. Yes. <laughs> um, have you become a convert? Oh, that's a difficult question. I don't think I have just yet. Okay. Well, <laughs> I there's, lived, there's still hope. I lived in Nashville for seven years, so I've still got to shake off a little bit of Titans, and all that, which I mean, it shouldn't be hard, right? But <laughs> right, exactly. Um, so let's talk about the Pittsburgh Penguins. Let's so you're do. an owner of the team and on the uh, a member of the management committee. Yes. So how did you get into sports ownership, and what is it about it that's of sports ownership that really excites you? Well. It Anyone from Pittsburgh knows that you love sports. I mean, you come out of the womb and you love the Steelers and maybe now you love the Penguins too, which is awesome. And I grew up very much in that kind of household and sports. I was at the Immaculate Reception. I hope some of you know what that is. I was at that with my dad. So I have good sports cred, went all the way also at Notre Dame, had a lot of great stuff there. Great. Bulls championships when we moved to Chicago. So lots of fun, but nothing, nothing compares to drinking from that Stanley Cup in Nashville. <laughs> Never said the Nashville. The word. greatest, <laughs> yes, the greatest moment ever. Um, so getting into sports ownership was really for me a dream come true. So who else wouldn't want to be able to come back to your hometown, be partners with Mar the great Mario Lemieux, um, in a back-to-back -back Stanley Cup winning franchise and you know, be a part of that. And it just really is a dream come true. I don't know how else to say it. And I would say that um, one of the greatest things about being successful is that you get to have some of your dreams come true. And for me, I have about 100 first cousins here in Pittsburgh, and I've used this as a way to bring people together and bring joy to people. And that means so much to me. 
And I joked before that I wish my parents were here, but they're no longer with us. But I, I really feel like I'm channeling them and, and helping keep the family together and giving people joy and a chance to be together through the team. And I've really enjoyed learning the business of sports, which is quite different, um, and uh, learning kind of about you know, team management. And uh, uh, so I have a lot more to learn, but hopefully we'll be able to contribute to the team's sort of continued success. And I got involved in it in the following way, is one day in 2015, I had been thinking about maybe becoming a sports owner in football or something like that. And one day my husband came in in the morning, I was working and he said, hey, the paper says that the Pens are, have hired Morgan Stanley to market the team for sale. And I said, oh, that's really interesting. Um, I'm going to call my friends at Morgan Stanley and throw my hat in the ring. I've learned from everyone that um, you never invest your first time, but it's a, it's a different kind of process. So I want to learn the process and get my name out there. And um, don't worry, nothing will happen. <laughs> Those were my... <laughs> Those were my final words. So next thing you know, again, a very lucky happenstance. The CEO turned out to be someone that we knew. The COO turned out to be someone that we knew. They had us in for all kind of due diligence. They treated me like I was buying the whole team when I was really only being an LP. And it, it just had kismet about it from start to finish. And I stuck with it through a lot of twists and turns in the deal. And um, I was able to invest right before they won the two Stanley Cups, and I forgot to bring my two big oh. rings to show <laughs> up. But uh, they're quite fun, and uh, it's been it's been a tremendous joy, That's really. Terrific. And uh, uh, I hope we win again. <laughs> Just not against Nashville. Exactly. So I can confirm that the sports fandom starts at birth. I had two children at McGee. And they both got um, Penguins gear. We really appreciate having you Thank here. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. I so appreciate you coming today and uh, sharing some of your day with me. So I wish you all the greatest success and happiness. Thank you. Again, great message for our students. It was great that you shared your experience with us and you had some advice for our students as well. And I'll just say, if you're ever looking for people who understand technology, analytics, data, and our future leaders, <laughs> you've got them right here. Okay? <laughs> Uh, and congratulations on all the success that you've had in your, uh, in your career as well. And I hope you have that third ring after this season today. Well, we have a small thing that you can put next to those two other rings. Uh, just a token of our appreciation for you spending the day here with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been an honor to be here. Thank you.